So hello everybody, my name is Steve Ertel and I'm the uh, lead scientist for the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometry at the LBT. I'm going to try to make this talk as coherent as possible, yeah, says the interferometrist. Um, one challenge of those remote conferences is that you can fix your instrument, observe and give a talk all within 24 hours, so there are some challenges here, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I'm going to present our instrument and mostly some uh, exciting capabilities and science that we've been doing recently and uh, are working on and some synergies with uh, future instruments. And uh, obviously JWST and the ELTs are some I'll address a little bit. So among the telescopes that can claim to be the largest in the world, I think the LBT might be one of the least famous ones. So I just give a little bit of a slide here of what the LBT is and where it is. So the LBT is the Large Binocular Telescope it's operated uh, not like ESO as a large uh, open observatory, but it's a international consortium with uh, US, Italian, and German partners. Um, the LBTI is the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer. What it does is it uses those two large mirrors of the LBT to do uh, direct imaging and interferometry and make the LBT the largest telescope in the sense of two large 8.4 meter mirrors on a common mount. So the LBT is located on Mount Graham down here in the beautiful southwestern US state, United States here in uh, southern Arizona. Um, going a little bit deeper into what the LBTI is and how it uses the LBT. So I put up some scales here. So this is a front view of the LBT with the two 8.4 meter mirrors on a common mount. And the LBTI is in the middle here in this green box. And uh, what the LBTI does is it uses the uh, two mirrors for interferometry, so it um, it uses the very wide baseline from the edge to edge of those two 8.4 meter mirrors uh, for up to about 23 meter resolution. Also 14 meters for nulling interferometry, which is center center uh, distance between those two mirrors. But we also do adaptive optics and use those two meters uh, to two mirrors separately for high contrast imaging. So the LBTI is really what makes the LBT this very large telescope, except for being just two giant buckets of light. So the LBT in the way it's built and the LBTI in particular, making it this large telescope, make it a really a pathfinder for ELTs. And this is both in instrumentation and science. Um, one thing that the LBT is doing, that's not specifically to the LBTI, but the LBT as a whole is, it has two adaptive secondary mirrors, and those large deformal mirrors are obviously critical for uh, adaptive optics on those uh, 30 meter class telescopes that are coming up. So LBT has been pioneering this, now ESO has one too, but uh, we're really fighting with those. We have a lot of trouble with those, but we make those work and uh, we're having the trouble now, so EELT doesn't have to have this trouble later, right? So that's very important. Um, so there are images of those secondary mirrors here. On the right, I put up an image of our wavefront sensor. Uh, one really exciting thing is that we can close the AO loop on magnitudes down to an R magnitude of 18 for natural guide stars. So that almost makes lasers uh, unnecessary. Um, another thing here is our entrance window diacroic. So that feeds between the interface of, LB, of, of, of uh, AO and our cryogenic instrument. So this is the entrance window into our cryostat, which also doubles as a wavefront sensor dichroic, sending the light, the visible light back to our wavefront sensors so that we actually have only three warm reflections before everything is cold. And that's the three uh, mirrors of the telescope, the M1, M2, and M3. And then everything uh, infrared goes into our cold science camera. Um, as I said, the rest of the optical path on the science side is fully cryogenically cooled. And I just put up one example here of how we're uh, pushing this possibility by having our path length correctors, pretty much our delay lines, if you think in the uh, VLTI view, uh, completely cold. So this is just one of our pupil mirrors. There's one on each side of the LPTI optical path, which does uh, the path length correction, the fast path length correction, tip and tilt, and also uh, chopping and everything, all completely cold. So there's a, there's a tripod of uh, piezo actuators on which this mirror is mounted. So we do everything. And this whole thing is about 30 centimeters in size, which uh, in terms of delay lines is great because the common mount of the LBT doesn't means you don't have to use those large delay lines. 
So now let's talk a little bit about science. Obviously, 10 minutes is not too long to go into any detail on instrumentation. Um, so our team has been focusing mostly on exoplanet science and uh, circumstellar disks. The main thing that the LBTI was built for and funded for by NASA was to run the what's called the host survey, which is a survey for exozygal dust uh, around nearby stars, so habitable zone dust around nearby stars. And NASA was particularly worried about that because it's a limitation to actually imaging exoEarths in the future with a, a space mission because it creates additional photon noise, background noise. So this is just one plot that I'm showing where we can show that uh, the LBTI has been pushing down to almost the regime where we're imaging or detecting exocytical dust at the level of the solar system habitable zone dust. So one SODI would be the solar system. So we're pushing down to, for the best systems, a few times the solar system level, which is really great. There's a talk by Vision Ni uh, from Mass later today. And I just want to point out that LBTI has received two NASA honor awards for that, one for the host survey itself and its sensitivity and one for building the LBTI. So this was super successful. In terms of sensitivity, um, that's, I think, a very important argument. In This is carried out at uh, 11 micron, roughly, so the N-band. And we reach a sensitivity of about a milli chance at that. I think that pretty much rivals we see on direct imaging is definitely unprecedented for interferometry. But um, except for this specific mode, we also do a lot of direct imaging science. So this is just a collage of things that we do from extra galactic, where our faint limiting magnitude for a wavefront sensor is really, uh, really crucial, to some evolved stars, obviously um, circumstellar disks and exoplanet uh, candidate companion that we have here, um, also evolved stars. But one thing that I want to point out, just to extend a little bit from the talk, great talk that Beth has given just a moment ago, is that we have the first AO-assisted high contrast imaging integral field unit operating at the three to five micron range. So here's a spectrum of, in this case, a brown dwarf companion in the L band, which Beth just pointed out is really important to constrain those uh, cloud properties of giant planets. And there's also a paper forthcoming by Jordan Stone on a couple of the HR8799 planets where uh, we present the first L-band spectra of those. So you don't necessarily have to go to chain uh, swap for, for all of this. And the last thing I want to point out down here is a uh, benchmark brown dwarf binary. So those are two pretty much equal mass brown dwarfs um, for which you have an orbital mass constraint. And you can also get the spectra of those, which for the first time we've resolved in the L-band. Um, so this is all about direct imaging, but one thing that's super exciting is FISO interferometry, where we get the full 23 meter resolution of the LBT, and uh, this can be used to get uh, high contrast imaging at this 30 meter class resolution already with the LBT. With a 20 arc second full field of view, so we're doing wide field of view interferometry as well. And uh, this can be combined with things like aperture masking uh, and with, uh, again, integral field spectroscopy already. In principle, we haven't been able to reach that technically yet, but we were, sorry, we we're working towards that. So two things I wanna show here is a image of IO at eight meter uh, resolution and at 23 meter resolution. And this is one example where interferometry can actually be used to uh, reach a higher dynamic range than direct imaging can, just because you're getting a smaller PSF. And another thing here is a snapshot observation of a disk around a Herbig star. And what you can see here, this is just 10 minutes of data with FISO interferometry, sorry, uh, yeah, FISO and aperture masking across those two eight meter mirrors, where you can do a snapshot, just 10 minutes observation, already a, a model independent uh, reconstruction of the image. So this is super exciting to add to those uh, longer baseline capabilities of the VLTI, for example. Um, one thing, this is a talk that Kevin Wagner will give uh, later today, I think actually the next one, um, which is- it's Just uh, to tell you that you have two minutes. Thank you, almost there. Um, this is where you can do direct imaging with NOMIC in the N-band to search for planets around habitable, uh, in, in habitable zones around very nearby stars. So Kevin will probably show this plot, but I've been a little bold and uh, overdrawn here a line where you can see what we can do just by extending this from single eight meter mirror uh, observations to FISO interferometry. 
where you can range a, a reach a factor of three higher sensitivity and smaller inner working angle. So you can reach habitable zones around a wider range of stars than just the very closest ones. And you can go down to almost super Earth sensitivity already uh, with the current telescope, and you don't have to wait for uh, the LBT. So this is just a simulated image um, from some real data, but a small amount of real data. Kevin will go into more detail on that. A few words on synergies. Obviously, James Webb is something really exciting right now. Um, LBT has the advantage to have about the same wavelength coverage with LBTI, at least down to 13 micron. Um, it has a slightly higher angular resolution. It's obviously not as sensitive, of course. Um, the other one down here is Roman, the Roman Space Telescope, which is upcoming. And for that, we have actually with nulling interferometry a slightly better inner working angle to reach habitable zone dust compared to the visible light coronagraph that Roman's uh, using. So there's some very strong overlap between visible and thermal emission from, um, from excess dicyclic dust. Obviously, I already talked a little bit about Pathfinder uh, technology and science for the uh, 30 meter class telescopes that are upcoming. Specifically, the GMT is uh, technically just the LBT with three different baselines. So in that sense, everything GMT will be doing is FISO interferometry, and we are really pathfinding this. Um, and this is not a future one, the VLTI, obviously, but there are future instrumentation coming up on the VLTI. And there is some very strong synergy there as well uh, to, as I said, get the full baseline coverage and high fidelity imaging. And uh, as I said, we are an instrumentation project uh, as well as a science project. And we would very much uh, welcome interest from people to exploit that. If you're building an ELT instrument like METIS and you have questions about how things are done, uh, get in touch and we can talk about how we do it at the LBT. And maybe this helps you plan out things with METIS. And that's it. I'm just uh, referring to a couple of related presentations and give a couple of references that you can read when you watch the recording of this talk. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Steve. There are a few questions uh, on the Slack. First one Please. is by Bernard Brand. He's asking, you mentioned that the LBT can close the AO loop on 18th magnitude stars. This sounds great, right. but what is the resulting AO performance? Just tip till correction or significantly better? We're getting, uh, well, it's, it's more than tip till correction. It's about the same performance you get on a laser on that. So it's not, not high contrast performance at that point, but it's good. You get to see a core of the PSF. Then Actually, we reached the, oh, sorry, the, go the, ahead. the really high performance, uh, we reached down to something like 12 magnitude where we reach peak performance and then there it starts degrading. Okay, there is another question by Roy uh, Van Buckel. He's asking, what is the spectral resolution of the LMIFU? So ALS has a couple of settings between 40 and 100, I believe, 120 maybe. So it's not high resolution, but it's the first you get. And then a related question uh, by Rian here. He's asking, what is the approximate sensitivity of the IFU? Um, we're not really limited by the use of the IFU. Uh, so it's the sensitivity that you get for direct imaging as well in L-band, which I believe for the LBTI is close to 18th or 19th magnitude in a something like a half-night observation. So if you go really deep. Cool, and we have one more question by Roy. He's asking, what is uh, what that was that a companion to the east of the Herbig star, and does the star have a name? Um, the star does have a name. I don't know it right now. The publication is by Steph Salem in 2021, so you should be able to find this very easily. Um, yes, this is a companion candidate, and it also shows that we can reach even relatively high contrast. Uh, with uh, physio-interferometry already. 